yes, I can see the challenge of yeah, getting very, that to be very <laughs> seamless and integrated. But a very unique kind of concept and uh, maybe could be a game game changer, <laughs> changer, very innovative <laughs> solution. So, yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the On Track podcast. I am Zach Peterson. I am your host. And today uh, we're going to be talking with Yoshi Fukawa, CEO of Tech Dream, also a distributor for NEC. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, his recent Altium Live presentation, uh, a new extension for Altium Designer, and some other very interesting things with regard to EMI, SI, and PI. Yoshi, thank you so much for joining us on the On Track podcast. Yeah, Zach, thank you for having me, having me on my birthday. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, that's right. You told me today would be your birthday. <laughs> yeah, happy Valentine's Day. It's, it's uh, my birthday, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, of course, today, on the day we're recording, it also just happens to be Valentine's Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> works out like that sometimes doesn't it um and uh so ju just recently uh, pr uh a couple of weeks ago uh you were presenting at altium live and um you know i was at altium live as well although i i'm uh you know pretty busy myself i didn't get to see every presentation but um it was nice to to talk to you uh you know afterwards on zoom and um you had said that there was a uh a new product that uh you guys have available as a, uh, an extension for all team designer users. So, you know, maybe we can get started and uh, you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, uh, um, we uh, before that, I would like to introduce myself first. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> my name is uh, Yosif Kawa from Tech Dream. Um, I started Tech Dream back to uh, 2002 especially focusing on EMC, SIPI, and also EDS simulation tool, and also PCB materials um, based in Silicon Valley, California. Uh, actually, not this year we are celebrating 20, 20 years. How, how time, time, time flies. <laughs> and then um, what we carry is, uh, as you said, EMI stream from NEC, which is today's main topic uh, for EMI, design load check and applying resonance analysis software. Um, but also, we also carry a uh, near field EMI scanner from API and another PCB materials uh, from Okumitsui Technologies, which is uh, embedded capacitor material or Farad Flex, and also high speed Holos material from uh, Risho in Japan. They are celebrating after 100 years old, a very old company in Japan. Wow. Yeah. But uh, let's actually focus on, on EMI stream uh, today yeah, for Altium. Uh, Designer. Sure, sure. Yeah. So I, I think uh, maybe some of the newer designers don't necessarily realize how, you know, the industry is set up like this, where you may have the larger vendors that build some of these tools or materials, but then you have folks uh, kind of in the middle that are responsible for distributing and marketing these tools and really connecting people who have problems yeah. to those solutions. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think before we maybe talk about EMI Stream, how did, how did you get involved in this? Yeah, for EMI Stream, originally uh, NEC in Japan, uh, as you know, NEC is a giant company in Japan developing some um, products like uh, uh, telecom products, server router, and a computer, but also some com um, consumer electronics like a PC, laptop, a cell phone, a smartphone. Uh, but the, they were facing real worry my problems and then they their internal EDA design team and the EM team they collaborated together to develop EMI stream oh I think almost 25 years ago and that uh, they started using EMI stream inside of the NEC but started uh, setting EMI stream outside of NEC uh, in Japan, so they have maybe I, I don't I, a very um, number of uh, the users in, in Japan, and then they asked uh, me to sell EMI Stream in United States to help engineers facing EMI problems. I see, I see. So it seems like I, I don't want to say that EMI is necessarily a new problem. 
But um, it seems like the company has, you know, both you and then also NEC has, you know, pretty rich experience addressing EMI, EMC problems yeah. with these kind of, you know, simulation solutions. Yeah, they, they had originally maybe 150 uh, design rules uh, to solve EMI problems, but they uh, narrowed down and um, uh, focus on only 15 very important EMI design rules and implemented in, in EMI stream. So 15 important EMC EMI rules and I you know when someone takes a list of 150 and narrows it down to 15 I sometimes wonder how did you decide on those 15 was it a survey of, of <laughs> engineers <laughs> or <laughs> you know <laughs> that, that is very good question I have to ask any say but I think based on their uh, experiment and the simulation uh, they had uh, they built a lot of uh, evaluation board uh, hmm. With, for example, return current bus discontinuity or bus split plane or uh, high speed trace near edge or decoupling capacitor, they built the different evaluation board to see the decoupling capacitor location and uh, compare with the simulation result experiments. And then actually they uh, boiled down to very important EMI design rules. So they, actually, they reached 50 rules. I, I see. So, so the way this kind of works is, is I guess, one of the features, because you mentioned a few different features in, in the intro, but um, I think the way, or the way I understand like an EMI design rule working is it's checking the layout for design choices, which might be electrically correct and manufacturable, but they could create an EMI problem. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, even passing DLC, we call the DLC for my, or DLF, design for my, DFM, DFM. Actually, yeah. we still, we may still have actually EMI, EMI pro problems, yeah, from the bad layout or bad uh, stack up. So it's really uh, important to follow a uh, kind of good EMI design rule. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. And I know that in uh, kind of the, the double-edged sword of, of CAD tools, as I've, I've mentioned before, is that they let you create just about anything within the limits of their resolution. Um, it's, it's kind of up to you as the designer working with a manufacturer or working with a test engineer or a simulation engineer to actually determine whether or not that's going to hit, number one, your performance specs, and then number two, whether or not you can actually produce it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, because without passing EMC standard, they, they cannot launch the products. That's a, a very uh, critical um, situation. And uh, usually for the last minutes, uh, just uh, before launching the products, we find a EMI problems, and then we have to go back all the way to maybe design a schematic stage or layout stage. Uh, to fix uh, EMI problems, so it's better to uh, consider EMI at the earlier design stage to shorten the, the time to market. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, and I think kind of applying the concept of design rules to EMI is actually really powerful because essentially what you're doing is you're pinpointing something in the PCB layout and saying there's the that's what the problem is going to be you should fix that mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah because i think the tendency is when a, you when you have a product that you're ready to launch and you do you, you finished all your prototype spins and you're on the last one you're ready to go into emc testing and it fails what the tendency to do is to just throw every possible solution you can think of at the design until now it passes your next round of EMC testing, which, I mean, those tests are expensive. You know, people don't just do those for free. So I like this idea of being able to actually have a system that says, you know, we check these 15 common things or however many common things, and then it points out, okay, there, that's what's likely going to be a problem, and you go in and mm -hmm, fix that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, especially a um, few very important, most important maybe design rules, including a return current path discontinuity, high speed trace crossing power and ground plane. So we have to k 
keep the loop area minimized so we actually the large loop area generate higher EMI and also high speed trace over split plane is also actually very important uh, to actually avoid um, to reduce EMI and also decoupling capacitors are very important and that's a uh, checks uh, like a re differential pair check if we have actually um, trace length um, difference or a phase difference actually due to skew, we may have a higher EMI. So that's kind of actually EMI design rule checks. And it's very important to mitigate EMI. Now you you brought up decoupling capacitors because I've I've had some uh, exposure to a couple of different tools that try to either essentially calculate like an optimum and then check what you have against that. Or what they will try and do is they'll look at where they're located. And then if they're located incorrectly, they'll recommend where to place it. Um, or they just calculate where the near field emission is. And then it's kind of up to you to figure out where to place it. I mean, how, how does the decoupling capacitor feature Yeah, Yeah, uh, we have actually two features for decoupling capacitor check why is actually physical uh, location decoupling capacitor location check as you know uh, closer to the power pins is better to to locate place uh, decoupling capacitors uh, but not only the distance between power and one uh, no, 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 power pin to decoupling capacitors but it's important the, the grounding stitching via uh, via to the uh, decoupling capacitor uh, is also important so EMI stream checks the distance between power pin and uh, decoupling capacitors and decoupling capacitors to the ground sti grounding stitching via vias. That uh, one is a physical uh, layout check. But another check is we also ha have a power plane resonance, resonance analyzer, which uh, we can see the, the hot spot for the resonance between power and one plane. So uh, if the, uh, we have higher resonance, actually it causes uh, EMI, and not only EMI, but also actually IC malfunctions. So we have actually enough decoupling capacitor, but uh, EMI stream using peak method, uh, partial equivalent, partial element equivalent circuit model to divide power plane into LCGL circuit. And using spy simulation, we get a, a very hot spot on um, PC, power plane. So we can see the decoupling capacitor um, effectiveness on power plane, except like a PDN, PDN. So we can, if we have very hot spot, we can move decoupling capacitor onto the, the optimum location to reduce resonance, or we can add uh, decoupling capacitors, or we can even reduce, uh, eliminate the decoupling capacitor for cost saving uh, to to reduce resonance, actually, to minimize EMI. So with, with the power plane resonance feature, that's mm -hmm. actually really interesting because I've read uh, mm -hmm. some journal articles, and I actually, I wrote a article on the Altium blog that links to a journal article that does what you're saying, mm -hmm. which is essentially it sounds like you're you're creating like a lumped element circuit, mm -hmm. right? RLCG model. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so kind of like a transmission line model. Yeah, we call it bit, like a bit spring model. Yes, <laughs> no, I, I know the one you're talking about, right? Where you have like the inductors in 3D and then yeah. surrounded with capacitors. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've seen that. I've seen that. So that's actually really interesting because, you know, with a computer, obviously, or I mean, uh, with like if you try to do that by hand, like it's a totally intractable problem, but you know you're essentially running a spice simulation to to solve this in a 3D structure. That's that's really interesting because I would have thought that if you have a, a 2D layout of the power and ground plane pair, you could basically just do like a 2D you know boundary element simulation or maybe 2D Maxwell's equations, whatever it may be, um, in that structure to get the resonances. So why what made you guys uh, opt for the spice approach versus like a 2D field solver approach. Oh, 2D field, uh, 3D field solver is very good uh, tool and also very accurate. We can get accurate result, but uh, the problem, not problem, but it takes longer. The simulation time is very long. So EMI stream main concept is very easy to use and a very speedy, quick analysis because 
we may want to have many try and error type of analysis. What if if actually okay. recovering capacitor? So we change the recovering capacitor value or change the distance between power and plane. We may want to try a lot of kind of scenario, right? So we really need very fast um, simulation speed. So any yeah it, it, yeah. And now, and now I see the value of a SPICE model because if you can just add a capacitor in, you're mm -hmm. just adding it right there into the SPICE model. Yeah, and also NEC developed faster SPICE engine. I said uh, mm. 20 times faster than standard SPICE engine. So I think if you installed a uh, plane resonance analysis, it will be surprised how fast um, study plane resonance analysis Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's excellent. Because I mean, like you said, you know, if it's a field solver approach, unless you can do some dimensionality reduction or, you know, geometry complexity reduction, mm -hmm. you're right. It does take a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that's just, actually interesting yeah. that you take the, the spice approach. Yeah. When I do um, power plane resonance analysis or PI uh, for a flat flex embedded capacitance material, I have to do uh, many <laughs> simulations with the different thickness, different decay material. So actually, I really, really need a faster simulation yeah, to try and error analysis. So yeah, so that's what I liked about the, the SPICE methodology yeah. is, you know, you essentially can do the, the parameter sweep like you would in, yeah. in um, some other commercial SPICE packages mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or even open source SPICE packages. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you essentially automate that so someone doesn't have to build up the model themselves. Mm -hmm. that, that's right. That's kind that's of what right. I'm hearing. Yeah, that is great. Okay. Yeah. So are those the only features, or did you? Men I think you mentioned near field EMI as well. Near, near, oh, near field EMI. Actually, we have another future uh, from power plane resonance analyzer, which we could predict the far field, far field EMI okay. from PDN structure, because PDN power plane becomes patch antenna to radiate the EMI from the the edge of the PCB. So since a uh, plane resonance analyzer can calculate the voltage along with the edge and uh, using micro strip antenna equation we can predict the far field uh, EMI from this PDN um, structure so we can play with a different decoupling capacitor uh, placement or different stack up to see the, the, the far field uh, from PDN so it, when, when you say different stack up like including uh, let's say another power ground plane pair yeah, 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 to try yeah. and add some plane capacity. Yeah, or change the thickness between power and the ground plane. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and I think most most designers who don't do high speed professionally, or maybe they're just learning, they don't know a lot about embedded capacitance materials. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could you tell mm -hmm. those folks in the audience about embedded capacitance materials and how PDN simulations play a role yeah. in what they're used for? Yeah, that's right. That's I, how I show the customers how to use the embedded capacitance material. Because using embedded capacitance material, we could re eliminate decoupling capacitors like a 0 0.1 microfarad or less, we could eliminate maybe all of them. So that's a simulation is a very powerful tool to kind of try and error our yeah, worry with analysis. Sure, sure. So, so these materials are, uh, I mean, they're essentially just like high decay materials. High decay and a very, very thin, thin material, starting from one mil or less. Sure, sure. And then high, high loss or moderate loss? Uh, loss is actually, uh, we have a uh, mid loss, 0 0.015 loss. And uh, we also have a lower loss material, 0 0.002 kind of low, lower loss material. But for PI, yeah, I, PI, we may want to have a higher loss to damp uh, the, the resonance. So. That's what I was just going to get at because, yeah, in, in for PI purposes, between the power and ground plane, you'd actually want loss. And I think whenever we talk about high speed, so many designers cue in on saying, well, you need to have low loss laminates throughout your stack up and you need to have you know low DK values. But those two things are actually counterproductive when that's it comes right, that's right. yeah, to yeah. power integrity. Yeah, for power integrity, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Uh, so you, uh, so as I mentioned before, you guys were at, or I, was it you and a collaborator who were speaking at Altium Live? Well, uh, um, I mean, were you guys de speaker? doing demos of the, the EMI stream? Of course, speaker, you mean? 
Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool speaker was actually from uh, another Yoshi, uh, Mariama san from NEC Solution Innovator. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, he's the main main guy for developing EMI stream in Japan. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so the EMI stream extension, I mean, people can go and download it today and start doing PI simulations. Yeah. Just last yeah. week, we released officially. So if you go to Altium Designer and uh, go to Lice Extensions and the uh, Updates, you will see two extensions. One is EMI Design Rule Checker, and another one is Plain Resonance Analyzer. So you can try. Actually, so the EMI. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. So, so the EMI Design Rule Checker. Does that happen inside Altium Designer? It's essentially like a, another set of design rules, or does that have an external application? Extra, uh, as an extension, when you open Altium Designer and open PCB doc file, you will have another menu in tool toolbar with a EMI design rule check and a plain resonance analysis. So if you click EMI design rule check, automatically converting PCB doc file to ODB++ file, and then opening EMI stream. I yeah. see. Got it. Yeah, super simple workflow. Mm -hmm. um, just accessible right there in all team designers. So that's great. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, what other uh, tools and uh, solutions do you work with that actually help people solve their SIPI and EMI problems? SIPI EMI, what <coughs> I carry is another product. Is, uh, for EMI, we have EMI scanner uh, from API, which is uh, using robot to detect EMI you know, from PCBs. Actually, we have an interface between EMI stream and uh, uh, API smart scan. So if you get the hotspot, with a measurement uh, from smart scan, but we don't know actually what's happening and uh, what causes actually EMI, root cause we cannot find. So we overlap the measurement result with the EMI stream and find actually identify the, the root cause causes, why it's radiating. Uh, so we have now interface between EMI stream and the smart scan. Another one is, as you said, embedded capacitance material to improve SIPI and to reduce EMI. And uh, we have another uh, simulation tool from Aurora, which is actually cloud-based cloud SIPI um, simulations. And also another one is uh, absorbers, actually uh, low frequency uh, millimeter wave absorbers and uh, inkjet, actually inkjet EMI uh, shielding. Really, so you can print EMI shielding directly onto your device instead of putting like a shielding can, can. Yeah, that's onto right. the device. That's right. Using inkjet, inkjet printer, yeah, to reduce the weight and the height of the. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, because certain conformal coatings have enough absorption at certain frequencies to be decent EMI shields. So I think that's a natural extension to go to just. You know, we're going to inkjet print shielding on certain parts of the PCB mm -hmm. to help uh, suppress EMI, or I guess also guard against uh, reception of external noise yeah. from from some external source. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's a really new uh, new technology. Uh, we have a, a lot of challenges, but now we are overcoming one by one. To, yeah, it's still R and D stage, but. Uh... Well, I'm sure one of the challenges is a really seamless integration into the manufacturing process. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you wouldn't necessarily be printing something like that on a finished assembly, would mm -hmm. you? Or would it just be on the bare board? Uh, after assembly. After assembly? Yeah, okay, so apply, it would be on the PCB. But we have to install the printer machine uh, into the um, contract manufacturing line, right? Assembly line. So that's one of the challenge, yeah. Yeah, so it has to come out of out of SMT, possibly go through cleaning, mm -hmm. and then go into a printer. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, I can but, see the challenge of yeah, but getting the very, that to be very <laughs> seamless and integrated. But a very unique kind of concept, and uh, maybe could be a game game changer, <laughs> changer, very innovative <laughs> solution. So, yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I d definitely, I think something like that is a better alternative than something like, you know, a board level shielding. Mm -hmm. Because first, board level shielding, obviously big and bulky, you have to plan mm -hmm. for it in the layout. Mm -hmm. But then uh, with, with board level shielding, um, it's kind of like, you know, killing a fly with a hammer. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's uh it 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 seems to me to to be kind of like the the caveman's way of mm -hmm. handling EMI. Mm -hmm. This is a bit more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in, a good thing for inkjet technology, uh, we can apply uh, not only shielding, but because before shielding, we have to apply the conduct uh, uh, isolation layer, dielectric layer, actually to avoid short short. So in the direct area, we can also apply uh, the kind of magnetic uh, material, ferrite type of material to absorb EMI, not shielding, uh, mm. shielding EMI, but to absorb EMI like a EMI yeah. absorber sheet. So we have a lot of kind of uh, unique features or opportunity, not only uh, EMI shielding, but also EMI absorption or maybe thermal. If we put the thermal, high thermal conductive filler in the shielding layer, we can actually also uh, solve thermal problem with the high thermal conductive ink. So this is very kind of unique, um, cool. Yeah, yeah that's it. that is very unique. Yeah. It almost seems like companies have to develop these solutions mm -hmm. because the laminates mm -hmm. are so stuck in the past. Mm -hmm. Like the most advanced I think we can get with laminates are like, you know, something like Farad Flex, mm -hmm. where it's essentially just embedded capacitance mm -hmm. material, mm -hmm. or like, you know, Rogers, where they're getting the super low loss mm -hmm. for, for RF materials. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, you know, they really just address DK and losses, mm -hmm. but they don't address anything else. Mm -hmm. So you're bringing up, you know, absorption of EMI, mm -hmm. board level shielding, mm -hmm. and then now thermal. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of wonder, like, what's taking the laminate guys so long to give us any more advanced laminates? You know, it seems like everyone has to come back and do something like this where they're printing a specialty material onto mm -hmm. the PCBA. Mm -hmm. Or is it just an issue that uh, so many designers, uh, they may not need those solutions, mm -hmm. and so there's not a lot of market impetus mm -hmm. to, to develop them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, what, what are the some of the, the major problems that uh, most designers, you know, cite having? I guess when they're looking for these kinds of solutions, is it thermal? Is it is it SI, or is it or is oh, EMI EMC, EMC the most popular? Yeah, that, that's interesting. Uh, good question. And uh, we uh, did a survey uh, during Altium Live. Mm. The question is, what is your challenge uh, of your PCB design? EMC or SI, PI, ESD or thermal? Do you know what was that on top, number one? Uh, probably EMC. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's really it's really the core of all <laughs> yeah. the other problems except for thermal, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, the answer is that EMI. Yeah, we, I think we put EMI, not EMC. I think EMI, but uh, yeah, EMI was the, the actually uh, most challenge. Yeah. So. I mean, maybe, where does thermal? Where did thermal sit thermal, on the list? Uh, I don't know why, but the thermal PI is not not so many actually on the bottom number fourth. I think EMI, SI, ESD, thermal, and uh, e, no, ESD, a PI, PI. I remember PI well, uh, um, thermal. Interesting. Yeah. Because you know the PI problem really is an, uh -huh. an EMI problem. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. And so you have to wonder how many of those EMI people actually have the <laughs> PI problem, and so should I, PI I, be higher on the list? I, I guess, I guess many um, Altium user is uh, maybe a small size company, mid size company. I think very, very yeah. high end companies are facing PI problem with high end pr products. That that's maybe one of the. Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's an explanation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I also wonder how many designers actually like have pinpointed that their EMI problem uh -huh. actually is uh -huh. the PI yeah. problem. I think regardless of the frequency range or high end or low end, everybody may face the EMI problem. Oh, regardless yeah, of, of the frequency. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's yeah, one it of can the happen reason. anywhere. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, especially and especially once it's like related to routing or something and you route something incorrectly, you don't just see it at one frequency, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you're routing a digital signal incorrectly and you create a huge burst of EMI. Well, then you see it at all frequencies because mm -hmm. it's all the harmonics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, very... Yeah, that would make sense why EMI, EMC is such a broad problem. Yeah, so maybe for high-end companies, they have their own EMC department and the uh, EMC mm -hmm. engineers, so we yep. yeah, can solve the EMI problem. But the small size, mid-size companies, they don't have a like, specific uh, EMC engineers. So usually, right. WE um, electrical engineers or hardware engineers has to design not only circuit, but also tackle with the uh, EMI, EMC problems once they fail the EMC standard. So it's very important to to consider EMI at the area design stage and also to educate educate uh, a, a WE or PCB designers for good, very good routing or stack up for EMC. So that's very important. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and to be honest, I kind of thought thermal would would not be near the last. I thought it would actually be more mm -hmm. of a challenge than ESD, mm -hmm. but you said. ESD was actually higher yeah, on the yeah, list. Yeah, yeah. So many. Uh, That's interesting. Yeah, ESD. Yeah. Oh. So uh, I, I think with with ESD, I mean, what? How do your does EMI scanner help at all with with tracking where where a device <laughs> might experience ESD problems? Yeah, actually, smart scanner has a capability of actually checking uh, ESD ESD immunity scan and a current spreading scan. We can actually yeah, solve the EMI, ESD problem. But the ES, EMI stream also has a ESD rule checker. We, oh, okay. we haven't re released yet, but uh, we have a, a specific module for ESD, ESD rule checker. So we will release, I don't know when, but <laughs> maybe in a couple of months or in a year, but we have a ESD rule checker as well. Well, anyone who's who's interested in learning about all of this, uh, please check out the show notes. We're going to link to the Altium Live Talk. We will link to um, some information on the new extension. And um, we'll link to some other great resources uh, that will help you learn more about some of these tools. Um, also, Yoshi, do you mind if we put your LinkedIn profile on there so that people can contact you? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll do that. And uh, yeah, that way people can reach out and learn more and hopefully get a demo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, one last question I have with, um, you know, bringing the board into, uh, into your tool or into the extension, I should say, you know, with, with uh, because you're doing like a spice based simulation uh, for, for EMI, EMC and for, you know, resonance analysis, um, all of the components matter. Right, mm -hmm. so they need to have some kind of equivalent spice model mm -hmm. attached mm -hmm. to them, mm -hmm. but of course, you know, manufacturers don't always release that, or you have to build it yourself, or maybe it just doesn't exist. And so, you know, as a designer, you're focused on the layout, mm -hmm. so you just leave it blank. Mm -hmm. How do you, how does the the program deal with that? Uh, for model uh, simulation model, uh, as I mentioned, we use a peak method. So for PDN model, we don't need any actually model. And for components model, we only need a capacitor model. So we That's it, just we, we use a SpiceNet um, this uh, format, which has a ESL and ESR and a capacitance value. So we already have a default capacitance value. Uh, Got it. Default Got it. library. So you can rely on using these um, parameters, but uh, if you have, you can import uh, the SpiceNet library from TDK or Murata. They provide uh, their own equivalent circuit model, SpiceNet model. So you can actually import and uh, um, set into the EMI stream. But I actually, I investigated with different capacitor models from TDK, Murata, Tayo Yuden, Samsung with their own SPICE model, uh, SPICE format uh, with the standard model, EMI stream model. I didn't get a significant difference. So I think maybe you could rely on a standard actually, uh, model, uh, like the default models and uh, run simulation. So that actually, you don't need to set many models. It's very, actually setting uh, models, capacitor models, most time consuming work. 
So actually, sure, you, sure. you must stream automatically import uh, LTM designer with a uh, capacitance value or a parts name automatically set into EMI stream. So it's easy, very easy, easy setup. Yeah, and and I suppose if the model doesn't exist, I mean, if it's a small enough package, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, the via inductance is going to mm -hmm. dominate. Mm -hmm. So that's taken care of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You you have the capacitance value because it's, it's a parameter on the part, yep. so that's taken care of. Yep. Yep. And then if you wanted, you could just assume like what ten milli ohm mm -hmm. equivalent series resistance mm -hmm. or something like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's just okay. So that makes I think that actually makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Why you know once you especially once you get to small case components, it's mm -hmm. not going to make a huge difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, of course, if yeah. you want to have more accurate uh, actually result, you can set up an accurate actually, uh, capacitor model. Yeah, yeah. And that's great that you guys have all of that information from vendors, because I, like you said, I know that going through and trying to assign models to every part in a board can be very time consuming. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, well, this is great information, and we're definitely going to link to as much of this stuff as we can in the show notes. And uh, this has been a very interesting discussion, and I hope all of the uh, listeners in the audience will uh, go download EMI Stream, will contact Yoshi to get some more information, and, and hopefully uh, get a license to use the extension. Uh, Yoshi, thank you so much for joining me. I know I first met you at PCB West a couple mm. years ago. I'm hoping I'll get to see you at PCB West or PCB East or this maybe year. Design Design Con coming April. I'm, I'm thinking I'll be hitting Design Con this year. Yeah. I've been asked so many times if I'm going, and I've never gone. Oh, so I oh, definitely really? need to, oh, you to should go. come. Yeah, we we'll have a booth. Okay, great. Yeah, great. Oh, you guys are gonna have a booth. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So are you guys going to have the uh, the API set up or the, the robot set up? Uh, robot, they haven't decided yet, but uh, for sure, Okumitsui uh, for that flex booth. Oh, I'll have to say hi to Robert. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it would be cool if you had the robot set up because, I mean, that's half the reason you walk yeah, through the exhibition that, that, floor is right. to see all the equipment. Yeah, that's you right. Know? I, I have to convince <laughs> them to exhibit. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yoshi. Yeah, thank again. you so much. And um, I hope everybody enjoyed this great talk. And uh, for everyone in the audience, uh, tune in next time for the All Team On Track podcast. Don't stop learning. And like we always say, stay on track. Mm -hmm.